This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Israel is on the front lines of a civilizational struggle that goes back 1,400 years. And we went there to see it for ourselves. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Presenting a special program this week. This was recorded at Harvest Revival Center in Brookville, Ohio, just outside Dayton, back at the end of July. A presentation I gave to the church there at the invitation of Pastor Neil Peterson about our arm-in-arm solidarity mission to Israel back in the spring. We took a small group there, spent about a week in Israel visiting sites that had been attacked last October 7th, and just bearing witness to what took place. It was uh, rather profound, I would say, Sharon agrees with me that uh, this was the most powerful of the four trips that we had to Israel. I know I've done a recent presentation on this uh, podcast about that trip to Israel, but uh, this one, because of the, 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 well, the, the kind staff there at uh, Harvest Revival Center is much better in terms of production values. So you'll get more of the, uh, the images and the video that uh, I took as part of the presentation. Also, unlike the previous discussion that I had for um, this this podcast, spent a little bit of time at the beginning of the presentation on the history of the conflict there between Israel and Hamas. It did not begin in 1973. It did not begin in 1967, 1956, 1948, or even with the founding of the first Zionist Congress at the end of the 19th century. This goes back much, much longer than that. But in the 20th century, it has come to a head. Now in the 21st century, we're seeing it play out. And uh, as we're recording this, uh, just to timestamp it, on Friday, August 30th of 2024, there are some intelligence analysts here in the West who believe that Hezbollah is planning a uh, another attack on Israel. One was foiled just this past Sunday by the uh, uh, Israel Defense Forces, the IAF, taking out some 6,000 Hezbollah rockets and drones that were being prepared for launch. Will the attack happen, or is this just part of psychological warfare? Uh, we're still waiting to see if and whether or when Iran responds to the assassination of Hamas leader Ismail Hanaya in Tehran on July 13th. So um, a lot going on in that part of the world. We went there in May. We're planning on going back in November, God willing. We'll tell you more about that at the end of this program. But now from late July, the presentation I gave about our solidarity mission and why we stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel. Took a trip to Israel and um, went with a small group because we wanted to see with our own eyes what took place there since last October. You've seen the videos, you've seen the pictures, you know what's happened. And, uh, it is presented somewhat differently in the Western media. We found that out last year when we were there in March and uh, some of the protests over ju judicial reform began and people were in the streets. At least that's how it looked in the Western media. The streets were full of protesters. And even the alternative media was saying, Israel is on fire. The embassy is telling Americans to get out. The parks are closed. The airport is shut down. People are... And we were there, our hotel, just a few blocks away from the center of government in Jerusalem. Rory was there with us. You remember. What did we see? We saw about a dozen people with Israeli flags standing at the roundabout. Where was the... We, we didn't see it, but our friends back home thought we were in danger, that we'd be trapped in Israel. We also saw it in 2018 when we were there. We were there, and the Lord led Sharon to say, when we were picking dates, hey, let's go on and around May 14th, which is Israel's independence. That'll be great, because it'll be 70 years since they declared independence. 70, what a great biblical number. And then President Trump said, hey, we're going to move the embassy. After we picked the date. So we were in Jerusalem the very first day that they had the sign posted, American Embassy, this way. Yes! We've got... We've got an issue of the Jerusalem Post framed and hanging on a wall in our home. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Donald Trump entering a room going. They passed those out in the hotel. I wish we'd been smart and ran up and down the hall and collected them all because we could have sold them for a fortune on eBay. But we didn't. <laughs> Missed opportunity. But that's beside the point. The people in Gaza, Hamas, stirred up days of rage. And there were protests and fires and tires burning along the border fence. And again, the media back in the West presented as though Israel's on fire. They're in day where we're getting emails and text messages. Are you guys okay? And we're in Jerusalem. The elevator of the hotel, reporter for the BBC, laughing about how he's going to go down to Gaza and do a stand-up down there. He's going to be back in time for cocktails. We're seeing in the streets of Jerusalem people pushing, you know, little buggies around, strollers. Life going on as usual in Israel. And we saw that in May. In Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, life as usual. What's going on over here in the West? This is a protest one week after the Hamas attack. New York City. That's a professionally printed sign. A bunch of professionally printed signs back there. By any means necessary. The world doesn't often agree on many things. But one of the things that we've noticed since last October 7th is that we can now finally imagine we're watching a scenario unfold that could bring the entire world against Israel. We are watching a scenario, whether this is it or not, something like this, where a dynamic world leader could rise up and say, Israel, you've refused to listen to the consensus of the world. We are coming to stop you. If you've read the book of Revelation, you kind of See where that leads, Revelation 19. Last October 7th, 1,200 Israeli killed, Israelis, 240 taken hostages. As of this day, 111 have not yet returned home. 111 out of 240, almost 300 days in. 300th day is what, Tuesday? I think we checked. Um... That 111, by the way, includes about 39 that the Israeli Defense Forces believe are no longer among the living. The chant that is heard on college campuses, protests around the country, around the world today, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. You do understand what that means, right? From the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, Palestine will be free. Now the irony here is that a free Palestine is the last thing Hamas wants. They want a Palestine ruled by their iron fist. You do understand that Gaza has not had an election since 2006 when Hamas took control of the Gaza Strip by killing their rivals in the Fatah party which controls the Palestine Liberation Organization and rules Judea and Samaria, what the world calls the West Bank. When Israel pulled out in 2005, forcibly removing Jewish settlers who had settled in communities in the Gaza Strip, Hamas waited until the Israeli soldiers were out, then they rose up and killed the opposition party. They have not had an election since 2006. Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Fatah party, has not allowed an election since then either because he knows that if he did, Hamas would win in Judea and Samaria. So Palestine, if it were under Hamas control, would not be free. It would be free of Jews, which is what the original Arabic phrase means. The original Arabic was been, it's been cleaned up for English consumption. In Arabic, translated literally into English, that phrase is, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be Arab. That's what the original phrase is. They realize that we Westerners, 
It's like, wait a minute, that sounds a little bloody to us. That, that makes us feel oogie. So these kids, bless their pointy little heads, are chanting a phrase that they think, me, freedom, yeah, that's a good thing, right? What do you mean by the word free? Is this what it means in the original language? Kind of the way we look at the Bible. What do you mean by this word? Is that what the word really means in the original language? And the answer is no. No, it doesn't. It is an open call for genocide. Now, I'm going to give you a short dose of history here, and I will try to avoid the watch-making scenario, which is a joke my father used to tell. When you ask Derek for the time, he tells you how to build a watch. So I will try, try to do that so we can get the lunch at a decent hour. Not to do that, that is. Um, the war that took place on October 7th is not the result of Israeli persecution of Arabs in the Gaza Strip. The Israelis aren't even in the Gaza Strip. And in fact, during the government of Yair Lapid and Naftali Bennett, he had the interim government in between Netanyahu and Netanyahu, they actually increased by a factor of five the monthly exit visas that were allowed work permits, basically, to people from Gaza to come into Israel. Because they believed that if they extended the economic benefits of Israel to their Arab neighbors in Gaza, there would be peace. And instead, according to investigative reporting that's been done, Hamas sent operatives over to work as gardeners and maintenance men and so on that conducted detailed intelligence surveillance of these communities. Hamas fighters that were neutralized on October 7th were found to be holding very detailed maps. Dog lives here. Security person lives here. Weapons are stored here. This was how they took advantage of we're going to loosen the restrictions on travel to Israel so you can come work. We will hire you. You will become part of our... As a result, 1,200 dead Israelis, 240 taken hostage, 111 still not home. The war did not begin in 1973 when Israel won the Yom Kippur War. It did not begin in 1967 when Israel, after being attacked took the Gaza Strip from Egypt, took Judea and Samaria away from Jordan. And by the way, if Israel is compelled to give back, to return to the 1967 borders, as many in the world insist, must happen for peace. That would make Israel the only nation in the history of history to give back land that it, that, that it had captured while defending itself. What's even more bizarre is that if you read the end of the book of Joshua, the summary of his campaign to conquest of Canaan, he defeated the Anakim, tribes counted as Rephaim, from the hill country of Israel, the hill country of Judah. Only in Gaza and in Gath and Ashdod did some remain. It's the end of Joshua chapter 11. The Philistine giants that David and his men had to defeat 400 years later. The West Bank is exactly the hill country of Israel and Judah. The war against the Rephaim is still continuing 3,400 years later. But in the modern world, the creation of an independent Jewish state did not happen by conquest. Jewish settlers did not move into Palestine and start taking the land away from the Arabs who'd lived there. And by the way, does anyone ever ask in the media... How is it that there are Arabs outside of Arabia? Because they colonized the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, North Africa, Egypt, Spain, back in the 7th century, would have made it across the English Channel in the 8th century, except the king of the Franks, the French, Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, stopped them at the Battle of Tours in 732 A.D. 1682. The second siege of Vienna, Austria. Look at a map sometimes. See how far that is from Arabia or from Turkey. 
If it hadn't been for the King of Poland, Jan Sobieski, and his winged hussars, the greatest cavalry charge in history, outside of the riders of Rohan, yeah, the Rohirrim, Lord of the Rings reference, sorry. <laughs> greatest cavalry charge in all of history, the King of Poland at the last moment saved Vienna. Had Vienna fallen, Germany to the north, which was a warring collection of principalities, Rome to the south, would have fallen and become Muslim. The history of the Western world, including us here in the United States, might be very, very different. We also need to understand that the creation of the Jewish state was not due to a cabal of Jewish bankers or the Illuminati or the Freemasons or anything like that. It was done through negotiation. Negotiation, trying to work within the law, building consensus... We had a little blackmail at the end there. I'll touch on that in just a moment. This was what was promised to the Zionists in 1920. This was part of the original charter of the League of Nations, Woodrow Wilson's dream. United States never signed on to it, but this was the original mandate. The Brits were supposed to take over after World War I from the Ottomans. The Ottoman Empire collapsed at the end of World War I, 1922, formally dissolved. The mandate for Palestine included, as you can see, all of what is today Israel and all of what is Jordan today. 120,000 square kilometers. That's what was promised to the Zionists in 1920. Two years later, when it was formally approved by the League of Nations, they said, okay, no, no, just, just the land west of the Jordan River. Everything else will belong to the Arabs. So it was reduced by 77%. Fast forward 25 years to the United Nations and the formal vote in the UN to partition the land. You can see it was reduced even further. The lands in dark gold there, part of the Arab territories. This, if you've got any military experience at all, is what you call indefensible. At its narrowest point there, that's like 10 miles from what was to be the western border of an Arab state, and the Mediterranean Sea. That's the 1967 border that Barack Obama insisted Israel must return to, what the world keeps insisting Israel must return to. We in America, we are so used to the vast open spaces here. It is difficult for us to conceive of how small this really is. Our friend Avi Lipkin lives in Judea, part of that area that Israel captured in 1967 from Jordan, which by the way, Jordan renounced all claims to that area in 1988. Jordan's like, all right, fine, it's yours. Abi Lipkin lives in that area there. He says on a clear day, he can look to the southwest and see Jerusalem. He can look to the northwest and see Amman, Jordan. We were up in the uh, Golan Heights. There's a mountain up there that is an overlook into Syria, Mount Bental. On a clear day, you can see Damascus. That's how small that is. That mountain is as close to Damascus as we are to Springfield, Missouri, from where we live. Avi came over, took his grandson with him. He visited our friends at Prophecy Watchers one day, came up to Skywatch TV the next day, and his grandson was looking at a map. He said, we've been driving for five hours, and we only went from here to here on the map. Yeah. In Israel, that would take us from Dan to Beersheba. Like, yeah. So it is difficult for us to conceive it, but that's how small Israel is. Now, this vote passed on November 29th of 1947, and I won't go into the details because there are books that have been written about this. I highly recommend a book called The Secret War Against the Jews. It's about how Western intelligence, British and American mainly, has conspired since the 1920s to try to prevent and destroy Israel. David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, during World War II, began to hear from intelligence officers, Jewish intelligence officers, inside German intelligence. Yes, there were Jewish intelligence officers working inside the Nazi regime. Jewish intelligence officers working inside the OSS, the precursor to the CIA, working in Soviet intelligence. 
and essentially to get the votes needed for the United Nations to, to partition Palestine to get an independent Jewish state, Ben-Gurion, once it became clear that the Western allies were not going to save the Jews in the concentration camps, nobody was coming to save them, so they had to save themselves. Ben-Gurion had to blackmail Stalin. We know who your agents are inside the United States. Had to blackmail Americans like the Dulles brothers, and Nelson Rockefeller later became the vice president under Gerald Ford, whose connections with Standard Oil made him a lot of money during World War II. Mr. Rockefeller, we know who you were doing business with during the war. Uh, that's treason. We will tell what we know unless you get your contacts in Latin America to vote for us. 19 votes. The Soviet bloc, Stalin, wanted to preserve his... his intelligence assets inside the United States. And so, lo and behold, 72% of the votes went for Israel. The Arabs were stunned because they had all the oil, which is why they had the intelligence agencies of Great Britain and the United States in their back pockets. They were making lots of money for British Petroleum and Standard Oil and other companies. But notice, from 1922 to 1947, the way the promise shrunk. And, and bear in mind that in 1920, again, that original promise included all of what is today Jordan. This is what Israel finally got. And then they had to fight to keep it, because as soon as they declared independence on May 14th of 1948, they were attacked by all their Arab neighbors. And that survival, again, is miraculous but don't have time to go into that here. I talked about all that yesterday. So what did we see when we went in May? We took a small group of people, seven other brave individuals, or crazy, we're not quite sure. Um, people say, you're going in the middle of a war? Well, yeah, the airport's open. Um, but, but there were people, and we had people, God bless them, from three continents, people from the United States, people from the UK, people from New Zealand, who'd been with us there before. You remember Neil and Sandy, Rory, from New Zealand? They came back with us. God bless them. Crazy Kiwis. <laughs> and we traveled around. In fact, some of those people said, you know, my, uh, my children don't know where I am right now because I didn't want to have that fight. I'll tell them when I get back. <laughs> we told our daughter, and Nicole was like, okay. <laughs> It's like, well, you know, we've had a good run. And besides, if you're going to get called home, what better place, right? The Holy Land. Well, one of the things we noticed when we first arrived in Israel, Ben-Gurion Airport, you see this display. People who've not yet returned home. These are the faces that, that greet you at the airport. Fly to other cities. Fly into Dayton, Atlanta, Chicago. You get all these signs from the mayor. Hey, welcome to our town. Our town is great. You fly into Israel. Bring him home. Bring him home. Bring her home. There are still 111 of those. We also noticed when we got to our hotel, which uh, interestingly was just a block and a half from the official residence of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, once again, it was one of those things. Where are the protests? We told the people are on the streets protesting the prime minister. There's nothing going on here. One night, one night there was a protest across the street from the hotel. There's a little square with a fountain called Paris Square, which apparently is the official protest site in Israel or in Jerusalem because they keep police barricades just kind of stacked up against the walls over there. And okay, protest, all right, let's put the barricades out. So one night... We're in the hotel, 7 p.m., for a couple hours a year. Boom, 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 boom. Bah, 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 bah. But very politely, at 9.30, they started closing up, and then they went, went home. That was it. That was it. It was not what we were seeing on the news over here, which was why we went over there so we could see with our own eyes without the filter of the corporate media. Our first day, we went to uh, Tel Aviv, and we went to a... Uh, a facility called the Shiva Rehabilitation Center. This is where IDF soldiers have been wounded in the war. Our, uh, this is our small little group here. And this is the courtyard of this facility. 
which, by the way, is staffed by a diverse group, Jews, some Orthodox, some uh, Reform, some we couldn't tell, some clearly Muslim, all working together, working to heal soldiers. Now, this was a... uh, this was a challenge for me. You might not think so because I'm, I'm comfortable getting up in front of a group with a microphone. I made my career as a radio broadcaster for a number of years, sitting in a room, a place like St. Louis, Philadelphia, Peoria, Illinois. Psychologically, it's different. It's different. But when I'm up here, this is like first grade me coming home from school and saying, hey, mom, guess what? Tell her everything I learned at school that day. So, you know, this is me saying, hey, guess what? That's fine. I can do that. But for four years, I worked in outside sales, and I had to go into guys' offices, people's offices, purchasing agents, and talk to them one-on-one. That's hard. That's hard for me. Sharon and I are introverts. We loved the lockdowns. (laughs) We have to work from home. Oh, rats. Darn. And now we get to do it all the time, which is a blessing. But here, we went into the hospital. We said, okay, what do we do? Do do we have anything scheduled here? It's like our tour guide, Yashai, who's the gentleman in the white baseball cap back there. Best guide in Israel and hilarious. He said, go down the hall. If you see an open door, go in. Introduce yourself. Like, go in and, and talk to them? And so we did Somehow they figured out that we weren't Israelis. I I guess having the little name tags around our necks probably was a clue. But we went in and we talked to soldiers. And they were, why are you here? And some of these guys have been pretty badly injured. I mean, missing fingers, missing lower half of a leg. And we said, because we want to show you that the whole world does not hate you. We are Christians from the United States, the United Kingdom, from New Zealand. We're just a small group, but we wanted to come here and show you that we love Israel, we love the people of Israel, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we love you. And some of them would begin to weep. Others would say, can we take pictures with you? Take pictures with the tourists. We brought gifts. The guy at the pharmacy where they had kosher chocolate thought we were nuts. We'll take everything on this shelf. (laughs) Do you have a trash bag we could put it in? Okay. Started adding it all up. Best day of sales he probably had in a week. God bless him. One of our ladies brought some honey, local honey that she brought from home. It's like, I'm sorry, that's not kosher. The Muslim nurse at the desk was happy to take it. So, wonderful. Met a young man there named Roy, who uh, turned out had lived in St. Louis for a while. No, we lived in St. Louis for a while. I moved there in 1989. Spent 16 years in St. Louis. He worked for a cousin who had an HVAC business there. He's wearing a Dodgers cap. Roy, you were from St. Louis. Why are you wearing a Dodgers cap? Well, I don't know much about baseball. But my cousin took me to, a, to, a, to an auction to raise money for a Jewish charity, and I bought a Yankees cap. It, it was signed by some player, uh, Bob, uh, Bob, Bobby, Bobby Ruth. Babe Ruth! <laughs> you got a cap signed by... Ba- yeah, I don't know who he is. <laughs> Who's the most famous soccer player you've ever heard of? And he threw out a name I'd never heard of. I said, said that's Babe Ruth. Well, I wondered why it cost me $1,000. Say. Add a zero to that, Roy. Hang out of that. That's your retirement. Good grief. But while we were there, we also met a young lady named Maya Regev. At the time, we only knew her as Maya. She had her leg bandaged up to her hip. She had been taken hostage at the Nova Music Festival. We were there on day number 213. So more than seven months in She was still bandaged up to her hip. She'd been shot in the leg. She was returned on day 51 with her brother. So she was in Hamas captivity for almost two months. Seven months later, she was still in the hospital. 
In fact, I looked her up last night just to see what her status was. She was released from hospital six weeks ago. So more than nine months in, th this is her testifying to a committee at the Knesset. And as you can see from the headline there, every woman sexually harassed. In fact, a gentleman just interviewed. He wasn't taken captive at the Nova Music Festival, but this man had been abused at the festival, played dead after his abuse, and his captors forgot about him. And he lay there until, but they won't give his name because it's humiliating. And I will say, and I don't think I'm reading too much into it. You know, you get to a certain age, you can kind of read people. That young lady, when we met her there, and the soldiers that were around her, they were trying to cheer her up. Oh, she's the queen of the rehabilitation center. Oh, is it? she had a haunted look about her. We can only imagine what happened in her captivity. I've done some reading on the history of Muslim interaction with the West over the last 1,400 years, with an emphasis on battles and, and things like that. And it is probably as bad as you can imagine. But they were very touched that we'd come there. No agenda. It's not like they had a thing set up. It's like, okay, today at 10 o'clock, the uh, Americans will come in and wave hi. No, we just went down the hall, met people, shook their hands, heard their stories. And again, they were just surprised. Why are you here? Then we went to Hostage Square in Tel Aviv. I said day 213, day 214. We went to Hostage Square, which is a rather powerful reminder of what, uh, of what Israel is living through right now. As a percentage of the population in Israel, what happened on October 7th is huge. It is like 9-11 times 10. If this had happened here in the United States, the numbers would be staggering. 10 million people in Israel, 1,200 killed. Now take that percentage and multiply that times 360 million. So this is the square, a pan of the view of the square. A number of displays there to kind of illustrate what, uh, what happened on October 7th. The yellow chairs representing the hostages. And that sign there, bring us home now. We saw a number of billboards around Israel demanding the return of the hostages, some of them very political. Um, there are those who blame Prime Minister Netanyahu for not getting the hostages home as though he somehow can compel Hamas to do anything. Um, but Israel is just as divided politically as we are here in the United States. In fact, friends of ours over there say that Prime Minister Netanyahu is considered an outsider there in the way Donald Trump is an outsider here. He is educated here in the United States, which is looked down upon by the elites in Israel. There are those who say that this intelligence failure on October 7th was so inconceivable that Netanyahu must have known he allowed it to happen so that then he could go ahead and do what the IDF is doing in Gaza right now, ethnic cleansing of Gaza. Our friends there tell us that because Netanyahu is such an outsider, it is likely that the hierarchy of the IDF, which is shot through with socialists, only tell him what they want him to know. In the same way here in the United States, there were articles that came out after the 2020 election praising the brave souls in the Pentagon who saved the world from the dangerous policies of President Trump by not telling him things that he was... Wait a minute, he's the commander-in-chief. Isn't it your constitutional obligation to tell the commander-in-chief and let him decide? Oh, no, no. He's a threat to the world. He's dangerous. That's how the IDF sees Netanyahu, apparently. And so their belief is that it's more likely that 
the IDF, which was kind of filled with conceit. Oh, Hamas is totally subdued. They are deterred. They wouldn't. De yes, we know that they're drilling attacks on make mock-ups of IDF facilities in the Negev. They're they're drilling uh, the, what, how they would go about attacking one of our kibbutzim, our kibbutzim there. It'll never happen. They're just doing it for show. So we're not going to tell Bibi because he might overreact. Our friends in Israel say that's the most likely explanation for what happened last October 7th. This is a mock-up of the tunnel or a Hamas tunnel. And if you've seen it, Maps of Gaza, you know that Gaza is just shot through with tunnels. Gaza is less a city than it is a fortress. The billions in aid money that have poured in there since 2006 have been used to build things like this. The difference, and this is what really struck me as we walked in here, you can see glimpses of light on the other side around that bend. When Sharon and I walked in that tunnel, we knew we were coming out the other side. But you see the faces of those along the wall. 111 of them have gone into those tunnels and some have never come out and never will. After that, and I didn't include the slide here, sadly, but uh, we went back to Jerusalem and we volunteered with a ministry in Jerusalem called Bridges for Peace. This has been around for 50 years. Anyone here? I, I see you nodding. You've heard of Bridges for Peace. Yeah. Yes, it is a good ministry. I had never heard of them until we got to their facility and found out what they do. It's a Christian ministry that basically sends food aid and other types of support to Jews in Israel. Many of them are the last few Holocaust survivors who don't have any means of support. Maybe their mobility is limited. Many of these are, are Jews who've just made Aliyah, and they don't have a support network yet. They've just arrived there from places like India, Believe it or not, the tribe of Manasseh, a big chunk of it wound up in India. And they're coming back to Israel, but they've not yet found jobs, places to live. And so they package up food and take it to them. Say, here, Christians of the world, we love you, and we're just here to show the love of Jesus to you. So we volunteered for a day packaging food. And I'm proud to say that the team Sharon and I were on, we packed more bags of food than the other guys did. Yeah, a rather small office, but they've got offices on five continents. You can look them up online, Bridges for Peace. I did an interview with the, uh, the local director there, and it was uh, something we planned to do. We asked them, in fact, when we take our full tour back next March, if we could get the whole tour in there. How many people do you have with you? Yeah, big tour, we usually do 100, 120. We couldn't fit 120 people, but we'll find a way to use them. So, yes, come on. And we are going back on another tour like this, a small, what we call solidarity mission in November, and we plan to go back to Bridges for Peace. The following day, we went to the Negev, the area in the south that was attacked. This is from the overlook from the town of Sterot, which is a town of about 30,000 people, 35,000 people. You see this uh, light area here? That's the border fence with Gaza. It is literally half a mile from Sterot. So when they cut through the fence at about six dozen places with their ATVs and their motorcycles, they only had half a mile to cross to get to the town of Sterot, where 70 people died in those attacks. While we were there, we could hear explosions in the distance from the operation, the IDF operation in Rafah in the south. That radio tower that you see in the back there, in that area to the north, that's the Israeli city of Ashkelon. It is, again, a small place compared to what we are used to. And it is astonishing that that half-mile distance was all that separated them from death on that day. From the overlook, we went to a playground. This is a playground in Sterot. You see that brightly colored? Looks like a it looks like a, like a caterpillar. The head end of the caterpillar up there. Believe it or not, that doubles as a bomb shelter. This is a look at 
uh, at the uh, front end of it, you can see how thick that wall is, made of concrete. It's because Sterot is only 15 seconds from Gaza as the rocket flies. When the red alert sounds, children know, run into the caterpillar. Because if you don't, well, on October 7th, this caterpillar, you see those marks there? Shrapnel from a bomb that hit that playground on October 7th. The children know when the, when the alert sounds, get into the caterpillar or get into the little smurf treehouse painted in bright colors, but eight-inch thick concrete. Who lives like that? Well, Israelis do for the last 75 years. From there, we went to the police station in Sterot. This was the site of a fierce battle between the terrorists and a group of Israeli civilians and police officers. This is what's left of the police station. That's rebar coming up from the foundation, or what had been the foundation, is now turned into a memorial. 30 officers and civilians inside the police station lost their lives that day. 70 people in Sterot altogether, including 15 people who were on a, a, a van, senior citizens who were trying to get away. And, and this kind of hits close to home for me because my mother is 87, lives in a nursing home. As so we hear you get a, a van load of 15 senior citizens trying to get away, and the van blew a tire. And while they were trying to change the tire so they could get out of town with the gunfire and the explosions around them, Hamas terrorists caught up with them and shot senior citizens who are no threat to these young fighting men, armed fighting men, and they killed them because they're Israeli. They're the enemy. So as you can see, it's been turned into a memorial site. The uh, terrorists overwhelmed the police officers and broke in, and this sort of commemorates how it was finished. They brought in an IDF tank. You can see the bullet hole still in the wall. This is facing that uh, empty lot that used to be the police station. And they brought in an IDF tank, and they took down the building on top of the terrorists. The mayor of Sterot said, as soon as they could, clean the rubble away. We're not going to rebuild on this site. This site will become a memorial to the police officers and to the people who died that day. But this is directly across the street from a, 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 it's a civilian neighborhood. Those are apartment buildings. And we found out the reason for that memorial on that center building there. During the fighting, a Hamas terrorist got up on this building here. A sniper and as Israeli police officers and soldiers came to try to relieve the siege or to break into the police station where the terrorists had broken in, the sniper on that building shot and killed 15 Israelis who were trying to neutralize the terrorists inside the police station. We learned this from the deputy mayor of Sterot. Uh, his name is David, and I forget his last name, but our tour guide recognized him from news media and said, tell, tell, tell them the story about the, uh, about the mural. And so he told us an off-duty IDF soldier found another off-duty soldier. Now, the first guy just had his pistol. And again, if you know anything about firearms, trying to take down somebody from a distance with a pistol is practically impossible. Pistols are not made for precision shooting. The second guy had his long gun, his rifle. First soldier says, give me your gun. Second guy says, I can't. Regulations. <laughs> Regulations. <laughs> so the deputy mayor tells us, we're not sure how the first soldier convinced the second soldier to give him his gun, but he got his gun. We're not sure if it was persuasion or if it was, look over there. 
either way, he got the gun and he climbed inside, he got inside one of the other apartment buildings and climbed up to the third floor, got into one of the apartments there, broke out the bathroom window and shot from the bathroom window a rifle without a scope and took out the, t- the, the, the sniper, the terrorist. And I'll zoom in on this because this is the reason for this part of the mural. There are dozens of stories like that from that day. And again, the people of Sterot planning to turn that into a, a memorial now. From there, we went to the village of Ophakim. This was the site of a story that we heard about the day after the event. We watch I-24 News out of Tel Aviv. Um, remarkable story. We didn't know we were going to hear it that day, but you can see the people in the neighborhood who are still trying to rebuild have realized that people from all over Israel are coming to their village to see what happened. Other Israelis are making trips to the south to see their community. And so they're setting up places. They're set, you know, the little umbrellas there by lemonade, by water. Many of their businesses were destroyed. We met a young man whose paint business, he worked for a company that made paint in the Negev. The factory was destroyed. He said, I'm out of work. And the government we, we have learned the government of Israel is even less efficient than the government of the United States. They are still waiting for help from Jerusalem. Luckily, I had a hat and we passed it. We visited the neighborhood. This is what the building, some of the homes in Ophakim still look like. You see that back wall being propped up by two befores there bullet holes in the wall, bullet holes all up the side of that wall. You can see the uh, bullet holes there. We met with some of the neighbors who lived next door to this home who had security camera footage they had downloaded to their phones from that day, and they were showing us, and again, they were telling us this through a translator, They shot the family dog. The dog was terrified. It was, it was on the security camera trying to get in the house. It was no threat to the terrorists, and they shot the family dog. But what we didn't realize until we'd been there for a few minutes was that this was the home of a woman named Rachel Edry. We heard her story. <laughs> And this is just a remarkable, this is another one of those stories, like how could this be without the hand of God? She runs the canteen at an IDF base in the Negev. She speaks Hebrew, obviously. She also speaks Arabic. So after shooting the family dog, the terrorists break into her home, five men armed with automatic weapons. Instead of panicking, Mrs. Edry says, you boys look hungry. Can I make you something to eat? <laughs> and they were like, uh, okay. So she started cooking for them. Do you want some coffee? You boys look tired. How about you take a nap? Hey, it's, it's, it's good. It's fine. So she baked for them. She made them food. She, she stalled them for 20 hours gunfire going off in the neighborhood all around. Explosions in the distance as the IDF begins to close in. They finally mobilize and begin to come to the help of the people in the Negev. 20 hours she stalls them. Her son, local police, he recognizes what's going on. He routes up counterterrorism troops, IDF soldiers, Mom looks out the window. She sees her son outside. Doesn't give him away, but she holds up five fingers. So he knows there's five of them inside. So he gets the troops. 
he gives them the intel on the ins- the layout of the house. You go in through the front door, turn right, up the stairs, that's the kitchen. Or whatever. And so after 20 hours with these murderous terrorists in her home, her son leads these soldiers and saves his mother and father. And this woman has become a national hero in Israel. She has murals on the wall in Haifa, in Tel Aviv. She's been turned into a cartoon. <laughs> Lovingly, she, is, she was visited by James Cleverly, the former foreign minister of the UK. She was visited by President Biden. Don't mess with a Jewish grandmother. She has baking skills, and she knows how to use them. But it didn't hit us until later. The people that we met in the village of Ophakim, how many of them would not have been there had she not stalled those men and kept them in her home, not knowing if she would live for the next five minutes? She saved her neighbors by baking for the terrorists. From Ophakim, we went to the Nova Music Festival site. This is outside a kibbutz called Re'im. 364 people died. Another 40 were taken hostage, including the young lady that we met, Maya Regev. These are the faces of those who died that day. It has become a memorial site and I would say almost a pilgrimage site for people all over Israel coming to visit and see where this took place. The festival wasn't even supposed to be held there. It was supposed to be southeast of there, deeper in the Negev. And two days before the festival the owner of the original site said, sorry, you can't do it. You can't do it here. You got to move it. And so they put it here, practically on the border with Gaza. The terrorists coming across the border recognized, hey, we've got a soft target here. A couple thousand people, only a few police. They radioed one another and they converged on this site our friends in Israel say this might have saved some who were supposed to go north into the city of Ashkelon. They turned and came this way instead. When we drove in on the road, you've seen the video of the cars burning outside the Nova Music Festival site. The scorch marks are still on the road. The asphalt still has black marks. As you're driving into this site, somebody died there. Somebody died there. Somebody died there. It is, as you can see, young lady there from the IDF. Soldiers coming there to see this is why we're fighting. (laughs) We went to one tent where a young scribe was copying a Torah scroll. He was from a community in the north that had been uh, evacuated. That was one of the curious things about our uh, hotel in Jerusalem. In years past, when we've gone to Israel, the hotel is filled with people, tourists, people from the United States, from Europe, from China, from Africa. This time it was all families who'd been evacuated from the border with Lebanon. Children running around through the hotel laughing and to get their backpacks on in the morning and they would get ready to go on the school bus. Hotel staff apologizing to us. We're sorry for all the noise. It's like, no, it's wonderful. We need to hear more children laughing in the United States. Am I right? We're not having enough babies these days. The Israelis are. And so this man who was copying a portion of Deuteronomy would allow people to come in for a donation place a hand on his while he was copying the Torah scroll. So a little section of Deuteronomy 
or Genesis, excuse me, it was Genesis. It was the story of Eliezer, Abraham's servant, praying to Hashem to show him the wife for Isaac. And this young man using that to raise money for his community that had been evacuated in the north. And now, I am officially a righteous Gentile. I will take that. This was a very powerful place, uh, a very emotional place, very somber, despite all the beautiful colors and flowers that you see there. These people were there for a trance music festival, which, spiritually speaking, not something we would condone or recommend, but they didn't go there expecting to die or to be abused, or tortured, or raped, and all of those things happened on that ground. And again, we're going back in November, God willing. A lot depends on what happens in the next few days. Did you hear the news last night? Hezbollah fired a rocket into northern Israel. It hit his soccer field. Twelve Druze children. Druze are like an offshoot of Shia Islam. They uh, believe that their first prophet was Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. Twelve children, aged 10 to 20, killed. Dozens more wounded. Israelis and the Druze are furious. So there may well be open war in Lebanon here very soon. We visited the sites that you would want to see in Jerusalem, and uh, I will talk about those some other time. I will just conclude this portion with this. We, we visited the Temple Mount. This is one of my favorite photos from this trip. This was us touching the mezuzah on the gate leading into the old city. I think it was the Dung Gate, actually, that we went through, but, but that's okay. This was our little group. And uh, I will treasure that, that photo for the rest of my life. But the reason I wanted to include this, first of all, we have never seen, we've been on the Temple Mount three times now, we've never seen it this empty. But this is what this spiritual war is all about. Again, I say it did not begin in 1973, 1968, 1948, or with the Zionist movement in 1897. It goes back to the Mount of Assembly. This is a phrase that comes from Isaiah chapter 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, or Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly. Key phrase there in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, the famous five I wills. Mount of Assembly, that phrase in Hebrew, Har Moed. Har Moed. That is the Hebrew phrase that John transliterated into Greek as Har Mekidon, which we then have mistranslated into English as Armageddon. Ah, it's the Mount of Megiddo. No, no. In the ancient world, in the ancient Near East, it was understood the gods met on the Mount of Assembly. Think Olympus in the Greek myths. For the Canaanites, that was Mount Hermon. For the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For Yeshua, Hamashiach. It's the Temple Mount, the Har Moed. Revelation 19 The world comes against Israel for control of this. This is where Armageddon takes place. The Har Moed. So when we go to the Temple Mount, it is like, man, we're on ground zero. This is not just a historic curiosity, which is what Moshe Dayan thought in 1967 when the IDF defeated the Arab Legion, the Jordanian army, captured the Temple Mount. A soldier raised the Israeli flag. Moshe Dayan made him take it down. For him, as a secular Jew, this is just a historic curiosity. Look, we'll open it up to the Jews, to the Muslims, to the Christians. Everyone will be happy. No, nobody's happy. 
because the war is spiritual. It is supernatural. And it will not end until Jesus returns in the clouds in great glory. And let me finish with this. God is not done with Israel. There are some in the church, and this is why I get passionate about this, because there are some in the church, God bless them, who are convinced that we have replaced Israel in the promises of God. That we are Israel. Spiritual Israel? Yeah. Physical Israel? No. No. Now, I know Vice President Harris loves Venn diagrams. There's a really cool Venn diagram that shows the overlap between us and Israel. And I will say this, as a Christian, we all understand that all of us need Jesus. As the Lord said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But as I said at the beginning, if we approach them and say, look, everything you know is wrong, they're not going to listen which is why we appreciate ministries like Bridges for Peace. Show the love of Christ. God is not done with them. Jeremiah chapters 31 through 33. I'll just read a small section from Jeremiah 31 about the restoration of Israel. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, coming, declares Yahweh, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says Yahweh, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. Now, there are some who'll say that, yeah, that was fulfilled after the return from Babylon. Jeremiah was writing at the time of Nebuchadnezzar and just before the sack of Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity. Yeah, they came back around 440 B.C. and then Nehemiah and Zerubbabel, and they rebuilt it. That was fulfilled then. Except that in verse 8 of Jeremiah 31, there's a reference to the day of the Lord. Whenever you're reading in the Old Testament, you see in that day or on that day, that's a reference to the day of Yahweh or the day of the Lord. That is a prophecy of a future day when God says, I've had enough of this foolishness, I'm coming down. When he appears on the battlefield, Revelation 19, Ezekiel 38 and 39. When he appears on the other side, let me tell you something. The one time you do not want the Lord to make his face shine upon you is when you're in the enemy army. And that is going to happen someday. On that day or in that day, this is not that day. So these promises of the future fulfillment or for the end times. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 11, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know that what the scripture says of, uh, of, of, of Elijah, excuse me, how he appeals to how he appeals to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Now bear in mind, Paul wrote this 20 years after Pentecost, which we agree is the, the day the church was created. Paul saying 20 years later, no, God's not done with Israel. And there is nothing in Scripture that suggests that that is the case. Verse 17, Paul writes, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. And then Zechariah 12. Zechariah, who wrote quite a bit about the coming day of Yahweh. The oracle of the word of Yahweh concerning Israel. 
Thus declares Yahweh, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. It's pretty good credentials. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples, a cup of staggering drunkenness. The people will act in ways that seem crazy. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem, again, that phrase, on that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the nations. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. The war of Gog and Magog is not just Russia and Iran and a few other nations. When Ezekiel was naming his coalition in Ezekiel 38, all the nations to the north, Persia to the east, Cush to the south, Put to the west, those were the nations that were as far in those four cardinal directions as his readers would know from Israel. He was saying they're coming from the whole world against Israel. That's what Zechariah is saying. Verse 8, on that, there's that phrase again, on that day, Yahweh will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of Yahweh. That's Jesus, by the way. Going before them, and on that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. This is why I say standing with Israel is standing on the right side of history. You do not want to be on the other side of the battlefield when the Lord lifts up his face and makes his face to shine upon those before him. Verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He's being really specific here. Judah, the Jews, the house of David, a house within Judah. As much as I would love to claim to be in that that number, I'm a Japhethite. I am not an Israelite. I'm grafted in. And I'm thankful to be grafted in. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I think about the religion of my distant ancestors. Who would I be worshiping today? Thor? Odin? Some of the Celtic gods? I don't know. But I do know that there is no other name that saves other than Jesus Christ. So praise God that we are grafted in. And as I said, we know that there is no special dispensation for the people of Israel. But as an old sales guy, you're not going to win them over by bashing them on the head. Yes, we know that the Talmud says some terrible things about Jesus. There's some Christian pastors who said some really terrible things throughout history. Praise God, we don't have to try to defend them. But here's the verses, here are the verses that I I think, this is where I get up my uh, handkerchief. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, this is God speaking, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, God will say, okay, open your eyes as he did to Paul on the road to Damascus. And they will look on him and say, what have we done? And they will repent. If we plant those seeds, the Holy Spirit will bring them to fruition. So until that day, we show love to our brothers and sisters in Israel. And we remember, again, a phrase that I mentioned yesterday that we saw again and again in Israel. Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. Amen. 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 And thank you. You want to watch that video again? You can catch it on a, uh, a standalone version of that uh, video, the presentation at uh, Harvest Revival Center. It's available, uh, available at our streaming video site, which is gilberthouse.org slash video, gilberthouse.org slash video, where we've got a number of other 
videos available that you can uh, rent or buy permanent access to, teachings, presentations, DVD, well, streaming versions of the DVDs, including our travelogumentaries, to borrow a term from our friend Dr. Aaron Judkins, of our previous Israel tours. Uh, again, all of that there. But this one, the presentation at Harvest Rev- Revival Center, it's there at the page, top of the page when you land, and it is free. So go there, check that out, gilberthouse.org slash video. A um, couple of things to tell you about. First of all, Sharon's first novels are now back in print. Winds of Evil, book one of the, uh, the Red, uh, not the Red Wing Saga, the Laodicea Chronicles, and the Armageddon Strain, book two, I guess I've got these reversed. Is it one and one and two? There we go. Are now available at the Gilbert House store. You can also get them in a Kindle format from Amazon. If you buy the hard copy, Sharon signs it before we send it out. Uh, these also available in uh, as audio book versions. You can get those at Audible via audio. But uh, books one and two of the Laodicea Chronicles, and uh, just as a point of interest, as we go, she goes forward in the Laodicea Chronicles. Uh, there will be some elements of the Red Wing saga that enter in. I should also point out that um, there are characters that are mentioned, especially in the Armageddon strain, that show up in my novel, The God Conspiracy. Yeah, we're writing separately, but sharing characters back and forth, which is something we started doing 20 years ago. The original publisher got a little, I guess, weirded out that we were talking and writing about things like uh, UFOs, crop circles, and uh, demonic possession and stuff. Imagine a Christian fiction publisher getting weirded out by stuff like that. Anyway, available now, um, gilberthouse.org slash store. And coming up, we've got some uh, other stuff to tell you about. Uh, Sharon's going to be part of a, a virtual conference in October. I will be in North Dakota next week, a Christmas conference in Branson. And, oh yes, Kamala Harris finally sits down for an interview. Bless her pointy little head. That and more as a view from the bunker continues. It's time for Back to School, and we have a special offer in September at the Gilbert House store. Back to School, it's impossible to believe. Where did the year go? Well, October is also approaching, so we have a deal for you. $35 only, plus shipping and handling, will get you two amazing books and a CD, which is interviews with Dr. Michael Heiser. Preparing you for All Hallows' Eve, the month of October, when we begin to think about the spirit realm, our book Veneration, which takes a deep dive into the cult of the Nephilim around ancient Israel, the source of the demons that plague the world to this day. And also a wonderful book by our friend Vicki Joy Anderson, They Only Come Out at Night. This is your manual for spiritual warfare. This should be in your church library. Those two books, plus a seven-hour audio CD with Dr. Michael S. Heiser discussing the unseen realm. These two books, plus the CD, just $35 plus shipping and handling only at gilberthouse.org slash store. Talking the walk every Sunday night from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is a view from the bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You'll find us online at vftb.net. That's our web hub. Also on uh, the social meds, social media, you'll find us Twitter at, or rather X, formerly Twitter, at View From Bunker, at Derek Gilbert, or at Gilbert House underscore TV. You'll find us on Facebook, the View From the Bunker page there. Please give us a like. Uh, also, Truth Social Gab, uh, me, we get her. Uh, Don't use those very often. Truth Social, some Gab a little bit more often, but you'll find me there at Derek P. Gilbert, and of course on YouTube at Gilbert House. That's the uh, channel. Please subscribe, share, click the like, and uh, then please download our free mobile app because that guarantees we never get canceled. Brings all of our content from the Christian company who's developed the app right to your smartphone or tablet. If you want to cast the video content to your smart TV, you can do that using Google's Chromecast or Apple's AirPlay. But the main thing is you bypass the gatekeepers of big tech. There's also a, a messaging section where you can join in conversations there, send questions to Sharon and me. We try to answer a couple of questions each weekend on PID Radio and our Gilbert House Fellowship Bible Study. You can also comment on these programs, share news items, and then, of course, prayer requests and offer prayers for one another. That is a a powerful thing. That's really become the the most active section of the app and the most active app 
on my smartphone, my uh, iPhone. So uh, you'll find it at gilberthouse.org slash app, gilberthouse.org slash app. It's also available at vftb.net. Just check the top menu bar there for the link. Well, Thursday night, Kamala Harris, some, what, six weeks after becoming the de facto and then the official Democratic Party nominee for president, finally sat down with a reporter, a journalist, and took some questions. Now, she insisted that this interview not be live. CNN recorded it, did a little editing, don't know how much. Uh, but she also insisted that her vice presidential candidate, Tim Walls, sit in on the interview with her, which um, some have dubbed her her emotional support governor, sitting there with her to help with questions that got a little too difficult. It was similar to her, her speech at the Democratic convention the previous week. Good enough, not really remarkable, didn't hit a home run, but didn't really embarrass herself either. It, it was really just unremarkable. If you're looking for content, if you go back and watch the video from CNN, you don't find that she really distinguished herself in any way. It was um, notably devoid of content, which seems to be a strategy for her campaign. They're really putting her out there as sort of the stealth candidate, just an empty suit into which voters can project what they think she's about or what they wish or hope that she's about. Um, similar to the way Joe Biden ran for president back in 2020. Now, he had the excuse of COVID-19 and he's an elderly man and so he's at high risk, so he's got to stay for his own safety. He's got to stay. Donald Trump went out and campaigned. And here, you know, uh, Kamala Harris doesn't have that excuse. COVID is still around, but it's not, we're not nearly as dangerous as we thought it was back in 2020. She is not suffering cognitive decline, so they don't need to hide that, or at least she doesn't have that excuse to cover up for the sometimes vapid and contentless answers that she gives to questions. For example, when she was asked right up front what she would do on day one, she said, well, we'll, we'll strengthen the middle class. Yes. Okay, good. How are we going to do that? No specifics. Um, the thing that struck me the most, and I will say this for Dana Bash of CNN, who is no fan of Donald Trump. She's made that clear over the last five years. She did ask some good questions. However, she didn't follow up on a single one when she asked Kamala Harris why you've completely changed your stance on fracking, for example. So when she was a senator, when she ran for president in 2020, she was going to ban fracking. She would push for a ban on fracking. Fracking is a type of oil drilling where you inject water fluid into the uh, rock, the shale below the surface to free the oil from the rock. And it is uh, an important part of the oil business in the very key swing state of Pennsylvania. It's also key in other places like Oklahoma, Texas, Southern Illinois, a lot of shale, Western North Dakota, a lot of shale oil in those areas. Fracking, an important thing. In fact, I was told, I didn't know this, when I was selling structural steel in Southern Illinois, 10, uh, 14, let's see, between 2011 and 2015, that uh, they've been fracking in Southern Illinois for a hundred years. I thought it was a new thing because it suddenly became a, an environmental issue. No, they've been fracking in the southern half of Illinois since uh, like 1905 or something like that. It's, 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 it's not a new thing. Anyway, she was going to ban it. She was going to ban it. And uh, so when Bash asked her, why why'd you change your position? Kamala's answer was, I've not changed my values. Hmm. Okay. Uh, once again, why have you changed your position on the border wall? which when Donald Trump was promoting it as senator and candidate for president, she was calling it a waste of money, un-American. And now she's saying she, want to spend, she wants to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to complete the wall that Trump started. <laughs> the material was, was procured under Trump, and then it was left out when Biden took office. Day one, stopped it and left the, uh, the steel tubing out there to just rust. Anyway, she's now flipped on that. Why? Well, because it's become a campaign issue in Democrat cities. 
where they're having a real problem with new arrivals. Again, you know, her main response is, my values have not changed. Okay. And she may even believe that she's telling the truth when she says this, but her, her value her value appears to begin and end with this one sentence. I really, really want to be president. Because everything she said in her political career is consistent with that particular value. Bless her pointy little head. We, uh, or I will be in North Dakota next weekend. There will be a program. I'll have that uh, uploaded and ready to go before heading off to Valley City, North Dakota for the Pitchfork and Hoe Gathering. This will be the second year in a row. Uh, honored to be asked to return this year. This will be next Saturday and Sunday, September 7th and 8th. The gathering itself begins on Friday. It's at the Eagles Club in Valley City. It's a big facility. And the, the gathering itself, the event itself, is sort of a... Um, series of seminars and uh, presentations on best practices for homesteaders and small farmers. Organic food, uh, uh, small farm maintenance or, uh, uh, administration and things like that. So really cool. And then a uh, couple of crazy Christians, me and Dr. Doug Hamp will be there speaking. So on Saturday, I'll be talking about uh, our forthcoming book, Sharon's and Mine, which is The Gates of Hell. That'll be out in October. On Sunday, talking about the secret history of Israel. Contrary to what many of us thought, uh, no, I'm sorry, the Rothschilds really didn't have much to do with the founding of the modern state of Israel. Uh, and I will explain who did. The history has been hidden because many of the players involved really want it kept secret because they weren't actually trying to make it happen. They were trying to block it. So uh, that will be... Next weekend in Valley City, North Dakota. If you're interested, you can follow the link at uh, the calendar at our website, gilberthouse.org, or the calendar on our app to the Facebook page for the Pitchfork and Hoe Gathering. That's where you'll get the latest information there. Lots of live music as well, and some really great food. I mean, they've got uh, uh, some, some great smoked meats and uh, stuff that they will be serving there, some organic um uh, 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 pastries and stuff. So, I mean, okay, yeah, this is a chocolate muffin, but it's organic, so it's probably healthy, right? Uh, jellies, homemade jellies and jams and preserves and things like that. A lot of other stuff there. So there's a lot more to do than just, you know, come and hear me talk for a couple of hours. But uh, hope we see you in Valley City, North Dakota next weekend. The first weekend in October, Sharon is taking part in the Inspiring Women webinar. This is a virtual conference being presented by Hear the Watchmen. Sharon will be one of the speakers, along with Vicki Joy Anderson, Tracy Tennant, a couple spiritual warriors there. Uh, Heidi Begley, Leslie Johnson, and other speakers. Uh, right now, there's an early bird discount. If you register right away, you get $20 off the registration, and you find out more at Hear the Watchmen. Dot com. This is October 4th, 5th, and 6th. The virtual conference, uh, the, the uh, videos will be available on that Friday and Saturday. And then on Sunday the 6th, a live Q&A session. So you'll be able to interact with the speakers and ask questions directly. So uh, something a little different there. Again, here at thewatchmen.com. In uh, November, I'll talk about that in a second, our uh, next Solidarity Mission to Israel, the Branson Christmas Prophecy Conference, December 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th. This is presented by Prophecy Watchers, so you know this will be a big deal. And the facility, the Chateau on the Lake, Sharon and I have been there. We stayed there one weekend, uh, couple, actually pre-COVID. Skywatch TV had our Christmas party there, and we just decided to go down there and, and make a little getaway. Uh, so we stayed there. It's a, a great facility, beautiful hotel, beautiful area overlooking Table Rock Lake, and um, with with a lineup of speakers like this, I'm honored to just have my name on the on the promo. You know, <laughs> you know, stick stick me in the in the back room, the small room. Give me a you know first speech, first time slot of the day. Don't don't care, don't care. Just happy to be there with L. A. Marzulli, Bill Salas, Billy Crone, Ken Johnson, Mondo Gonzalez, Josh Peck, Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis, Alex Newman, Brandon Holthouse, Holthouse, excuse me, Olivier Melnick, Larry Allison, Doug Hershey, and more. Uh, this will be a great gathering, and at that time of year, Branson is beautiful. If you come spend an extra day or two, go to uh, Silver Dollar City, which will be dolled up for, for Christmas. Branson, of course, will have a lot of Christmas shows going on at that time. Um, I can vouch for 
Dolly's Dixie Stampede, man, their Christmas show is fantastic. I mean, camels and everything. So don't miss it. December 5th through 8th, the Branson Christmas Prophecy Conference. Get information at uh, prophecywatchers.com or bransonchristmasprophecyconference.com. Now, our tours of Israel. We are planning to go back in November. Obviously, a lot depends on what happens there with the conflict. We are praying that things will remain peaceful, but uh, we note that this week, not only did Israel preempt a massive Hezbollah strike that probably would have triggered a wider war, they also launched their largest military operation in Judea and Samaria, what the world calls the West Bank, actually was focused on Samaria, the northern part of the uh, West Bank, aimed at uh, taking out terror cells that are being armed by Iran. Iran is using proxies, not just in Gaza and in Lebanon, but in Samaria, trying to arm them and instigate October 7th type attacks in the heavily populated areas of central Israel around Jerusalem. So Israel has gone in there. As of this recording on Friday afternoon, that operation, which began Tuesday, is still ongoing. So this is kind of a big deal, and obviously this is something we are watching. A number of major airlines, American, European, have uh, suspended flights to Israel. But as of now, we're still planning on going there November uh, 6th through 13th. One-week tour. It'll be a small group. And uh, we'll go visit sites in the south. As you saw in the, in the, in, before the break, we will go back to the site of the Nova Music Festival. We will go to Sterot. We will probably go back to Ofakim. And we will visit the uh, soldiers at the uh, Shiva Rehabilitation Hospital in uh, Tel Aviv. We'll go to Hostage Square. And, of course, we'll go to Jerusalem and visit the important sites there, like the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives, and others. We will visit the historic locations of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus on the Mount of Olives. So if you want more information and you're interested and brave, you can find out more at uh, gilberthouse.org slash travel, gilberthouse.org slash travel. Travel the next spring, our Iron and Myth Tour of Israel, still on March 25th through April 3rd. Special guests, Doug Van Dorn, Dr. Judd Burton, and Timothy Albarino. This will be like a rolling conference as we go to these various sites. I really, really want to see Judd Burton back at Caesarea Philippi, the Grotto of Pan, because he did his doctoral dissertation there. He excavated there. He was part of an archaeological dig at Caesarea Philippi. I want him to have the opportunity to speak to a group there at Caesarea Philippi and tell us why that site is so historically and spiritually significant. And you can be part of that group. Information and a link to the Lipkin Tours website to reserve your spot, gilberthouse.org travel. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen as the case may be. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, click the subscribe button, share it with your friends, and then please download our app. If you're listening, whether uh, you've subscribed at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, which is now YouTube Music, excuse me, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, or wherever fine podcasts are sold, thank you. Thank you for doing that and uh, joining us on this long journey of investigation and discovery. Our announcer is the inimitable DC Good. And A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution, not commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Good night, Oliver, wherever you are. I'm Derek Gilbert. This is A View from the Bunker. Mm-hmm.